Okay. This time we have defensive coordinator Jeff Coons. Questions for Coach Coons? Great. So, Jeff, start with the difference in the two games. Obviously, you got turnovers, limited explosive plays at Cincinnati, opposite this past week. What was the difference in the two? Well, I think that um, it's a great way to kind of compare the two the two games. You know, everyone's really excited about that game. You get the takeaways. You get some long drives in there where we kind of stay the course. And um, when you look at this game, you know, we had some long drives, and we weren't able to to keep them out of the end zone. And you look at the first half right now, and for them to score five touchdowns on five drives, us only get one stop, um, not, not a good enough job by me to get them prepared to play in this game, the bottom line. Um, you know, the plan was different than the Cincinnati plan, uh, even though call-wise, the amount of pressures and the amount of um, disguise packages and all that, it was exactly the same, just a little bit different uh, mentality because it was a different offense. Um, but we got to do a better job of getting our guys in the right positions and giving them a chance to com um, consistently execute. And that's, that's really where you know, the, the fault was there at the beginning. Army, you load, uh, what do you, how do you slow him down? Yeah, you know, you got to keep great edges on the defense. At the end of the day, you got to you got to keep technique all 11 guys across the board. You know, if you're the backside guy pursuing the ball, you got to keep technique, you got to keep your shoulder square. Um, he's a he's a threat to go anywhere at any time. And um, he understands the blocking, he understands their scheme. It's a great challenge for us because it's it, again, it all bases off of the inside zone scheme that we just saw uh, on Saturday against Baylor. Uh, so, you know, going to be an incredible uh, challenge. He can kind of tell what the vibe is and how his team maybe is going to play throughout the week. Mm -hmm. Can you, have, and now as the DC with this team, and what did you notice this past week? You say you didn't get him ready to play as a different scheme, but what were you expecting as the week unfolded? Well, I was expecting us to attack. I was expecting us to execute um, and, and understand, have a full understanding of our plan. Um, going through the week, um, I thought we had that. Um, I think that, you know, as hindsight, is always 2020 when you go back to the game and there's a couple things you'd like to do different and as the game you know unravels you'd like to be able to adjust certain things and I think you know the one thing the guys did do when they came out from the second half we we made some adjustments they they took those adjustments to heart and you know we did respond uh, after a, a difficult halftime and and basically coming to re realization of what happened in the first half uh, but then we've got to finish and, and again the the lull there in the middle of the fourth quarter um, allowing you know, just the, the inconsistent play to pop up again is, is, you know, not what we're shooting for. So to answer your question, um, I thought we had a solid week of practice. I, I thought we did develop the plan as the week went on, and, and I felt pretty good about our understanding of that execution. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about the performance on Saturday, and that's what we all want. From a broader coordinator perspective, when I look at these last couple of games, what do you feel are kind of the, the points where the past defense really struggles and, and what's kind of left to, that you can look at and say, okay, we can we can tinker with it here and here, try and get us back on the right path. Yeah, I, well, I think you go just looking at the two games and again, the last two game body of work since the bye week, you know, at Cincinnati, we, we you know, we challenged some guys. We we had got we put guys in situations to to challenge them, and they and they were able to do that um, in some match situations, some man situations, things like that. Um, what happened in this game was completely different in that um, the opportunity to play match defense and to play more man coverage didn't present itself as much because of the down and distance situation, and that's really where I come into that and having guys giving guys an opportunity to be successful on first down so that we can play different types of coverages on second down, that's advantageous to us. And it's not second and short, which is obviously advantageous to the offense. And then you look at that game, we had six, six times they were in third and one or two. And you've got to, you know, our third down percentage wasn't near good enough, but almost half of those were all by one or two yards. And when you're living in third and one or two, it's really hard to sit there and, and bring the farm on third and one when they're backed up on their own 35 yard line. And if one gap gets through, which is what happened on the very last touchdown, one piece is out, it's gonna be a touchdown. And, and that's, that's actually what happened at the end of the game there when we, were, when we were in four minute defense, when we had to sell out to try to get the ball back. Um, so I think coverage wise, you know, Saturday, um, 
There was more zone opportunities um, as the game went on. We tried to match some things early on, and uh, we gave up some explosives. And, and, you know, a big thing that I've always talked about was, you know, on our standard of defense is obviously getting lined up, playing extremely hard, and then limiting explosive plays and controlling the run game. And we had five explosive plays, four touchdowns in this game, and that, that can't happen. And, and some were in man, some were in zone. Uh, so we've got to do a good job of understanding the why behind the coverages that are called, whether it's man or zone, and all the pieces have to work together. Not every single one of those was a corner, was a safety. You know, th there's underneath parts to this too that all tie in, and it's very important that they understand that moving forward. And, and it's again, it's learning, learning on Mondays and what we can't do and what we have to get better at for Tuesday. What do you say to the guys to keep kind of keep their spirits up, keep them lifted up? Because I'm sure. They're busting their humps all year to try and get this fixed. It's still not working. I'm sure there's probably a lot of real kind of yeah. weight on their shoulders. How do you kind of yeah. remove some of that? Well, there's a ton of frustration, and, and that's fair. And I, I, I'm frustrated too. Uh, a lot of people in the program are frustrated right now. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it's like uh, WVU Sports Marketing has this deal. Uh, when you go to, I was taking my family to church Sunday morning, and they had a billboard up that said six days of game day, UCF, six days. And it was like, okay, reminder, like, all right, guys, like, we're playing a game in six, in six days, and we got to come back, and we got to go to work, and it's about what we do next Saturday. Now we got to own Saturday. We got to understand that. We got to do self scout. We got to know what the other teams are watching. But at the end of the day, it's about executing and understanding that if this guy would have done this, this would have been the outcome. If this guy would have done this, this would have been the outcome. If this guy would have aligned here, this would have been the outcome. If I would have put this guy in this situation less, this would have been the outcome. If I would have put this guy in this situation more this would have been the outcome. And you've got to, it's a collective part of that. And there's no magic answer. There's no magic potion. At the end of the day, it's about going to work and understanding that I got to do my part better as a coach. They got to do their part better as a player because we're all in this thing together. And <clears throat> collectively building that camaraderie and building that ownership as a whole is hopefully what gives them hope. And then you point out the positives. You come out of the second half and you can imagine what halftime was like. A lot of disappointment, a lot of frustration, a lot of, a lot of you know, and we just went to work and we made a couple tweaks, couple, not nothing earth shattering, but we come out and you get three stops in a row to start the game. It's a seven point ball game as bad as we played. And you can sit there and go, look, this is an offense right now that's put up crazy yards and crazy points the last three weeks. Our expectation was that we were going to stone them. However, that didn't happen in the first half. What are we going to do to fix it? And we come out, we play, you know, better football for a certain amount of time. And then we got to finish. We got we got to finish. We gave up two touchdowns in fourth quarter. That shouldn't have happened. And uh, we got to continue to work on that, just like a lot of other things. Yeah, the long touchdowns that you mentioned there, um, fair to say they were fairly different plays too. Um, yes. So fairly different mistakes as well. It wasn't yes. like one pattern. Yes. Um, I mean, we had we had a missed tackle on a hitch ball that, you know, we got to get the ball down. We had two guys right there to make the play. We got to make the play. We had a misfit uh, for a 51-yard touchdown, um, and again, we got to try to get that ball down. But we can't misfit. It was a it was a base it was a base run fit that um, we've got to be able to execute that, and and we got to try to um, you know make it as make it so where the guys can play as fast as possible. And, and that's at the end of the day, uh, we were playing fast, but we misfit that, and then we had another long touchdown where um, really really three pieces of his own coverage um, weren't weren't where they needed to be and, and kind of executing where they needed to be on that play. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, it was different. It was different, different types of defenses, different types of plays and, and different places where things weren't necessarily married up where they should have been. My curiosity, you made two changes to the starting lineup. I understand Josiah, but I believe spells is in for Fagan, right? Um, and then you made quick sh shifts to somebody else there. Um, mm -hmm. Just I imagine you kind of puzzle over making a change in the starting lineup. You want to give a guy a chance, maybe a couple of series or a couple of plays. How do you decide to say that's not working? Let's try someone something else. Yeah, well, I think once you get in the game, there's there's an accountability that we have and a responsibility that we have to make sure that we're giving our guys a chance to be successful from series to series, from play to play. And when you get into rotations right now, um, there's there's guys that had opportunities, maybe didn't make those opportunities count, and you got to give somebody else another opportunity to do that. There's some cases where um, there was a switch in the lineup for other reasons, and then you make a, you make a change, and then a hot hand kind of gets, gets noticed. And okay, so then you go with the hot hand, now there's a stop, Okay, all right, let's, let's see how the hot hand is going and how they're reacting to it and responding. Everybody responds to things differently. 
every player, every coach responds to things differently. And sometimes when you get in a game like that, seeing how guys are responding and see how guys are playing, and now as the game develops and that story is being written and that story is being changed, you got to see how, who's, who's navigating through that the best. And that's what we're trying to do as the game goes on. What needs to happen to improve the tackling, especially for a team like you see after likes to get out and bring a Absolutely. Phenomenal. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal question. And at the end of the day, the answer is that we've got to have guys that attack at the ball with leverage. We have to understand our leverage. And in week 10, you're probably tired of hearing that. But at the end of the day, every coverage, every front has a leverage aspect of it. And if, if I'm playing my 111th, I'm playing my position, and I get to the ball carrier, I have to attack that ball carrier with a certain leverage. So that if I do miss the tackle, there's someone else that should be close if we're playing with the effort we're supposed to be. Now, in those tackles that are in those man to man, no help, I got to be able to get the ball down. I.e., you know, Anthony Wilson, I think, had 14, 15 tackles in that game. Well, he was at the point of attack, I think, 18 times. Three of them he didn't make, 15 of them he did, you know, and we got to be able to be, you know, um, able to get that down. And, and that kid played really extremely hard. And, and you know, you're going you're gonna to miss tackles, you're going to miss plays, you know. That's part of it, but understanding leverage points and then understanding how to attack those leverage points and then us continuing to work on those. We do tackling every Tuesday. Uh, we do a version of, of, you know, not necessarily contact tackling, but there's multiple ways to work tackling and it doesn't have to just be physicality every single time. But understanding leverage, understanding the eye placement, understanding how to finish and, and, and doing that and practicing that is what you have to continue to do. And that's, you know, um, I'll go back, you know, Jeff Hosteller came and talked to the team back in, in uh, fall camp and asked him, hey, what was the difference between the Super Bowl champs teams and the non-Super Bowl teams that you were part of? And he said, the Super Bowl teams did the same things in December and January that they did in August and September. All right, and they, they never got away from the detail things. And we're not doing that. We're not getting away from that. We're going to continue to work on tackling. We're going to continue to practice it. Just because they might be a fourth or fifth year guy doesn't mean they can't still practice tackling. And we're going to continue to do that. In here a little bit earlier, what's his growth been like from your from your perspective, and the way he's really you know gotten into the to the role of long snapper to become a very very effective person in this position? I think that Austin has developed a true understanding of how important he is to the to the to the impact of our you know our punt and our field goal teams. And, and I say that he came here to be the long snapper and he, you know, he was recruited to come here and do that and he knew he had a job. But I think what he's developed is like, me being elite really, really helps us. And me being consistent really, really helps us. And it really, it sets up our entire scheme when it gets to the punt scheme part of this. And then how he covers and then how he goes to work. This year what he's done is to another level he is a lead by example guy on this team because of what he puts into this and how he's developed his body over three years and four years and, and what he's done to, to put himself on the radar to give himself a chance to play at the next level. And everybody sees that from the freshman DB to the receiver that may not be real close with him, but they see him work and they see how he approaches the game. And I got a ton of respect for him, man. He's a mature guy. He loves football. The guy loves football, not just snapping. He loves football. And you gravitate to guys like that. And, and he's, he's been fun to be around for this, this whole journey. Have people from the next level reached out or inquired about Austin at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. What, what are those conversations like? like? Are they asking about specific things with him? It's more comments. It's more like, dang, this guy's, this guy's a real deal. And he's like, yeah, yeah, he is. You know? And, and, and his, in his craft, you either have the dimensions or you don't. And then you either have the speed and the accuracy or you don't. It's very hit or miss. It's, it's like a pitcher. You're like, he can throw strikes and he can throw it fast or he can't. And, you know, once they look, go back and look at the film, they go, oh, man, this guy's, this guy's developed his body into this and he can do this. That's, that's, that's pretty impressive. So it's, it's more or less comments than anything else. You faced an awful lot of good running backs. Mm -hmm. Yet they haven't, they haven't really killed you. I mean... It's been it's been fast defenses that's done that. Is why is that? Why why have you had success against running backs and which takes tackling? Yeah. And is it more coverage than it is tackling back there? No, I think I, when it comes to elite running backs, I think it's every every defense has a fit, and there's a front fit, there's a D line fit, there's a linebacker fit, and then there's a secondary fit, and in every single call that you have. All 11 guys have got to understand their fit and where it fits into the big 
picture schematically. And I think when we've done really good against elite running backs, we have a bunch of selfless guys that are playing to their fit. They're not chasing plays, and they're playing to their fit. And then for us, everything that we have success-wise in the run game starts up front with our defensive line and, and how effective they are playing blocks. Um, if they are getting double teams and freeing up backers, then great. And then at the linebacker position, if we're fitting the run fast and they're very clear on what to do and they know how to get there, they're going to pull double teams off and then you're going to have D linemen making those tackles. And then after that, that secondary support being where they're supposed to be to get, to get the ball down. And stopping an elite back doesn't mean maybe holding them to you know, 30 yards. It's eliminating the explosive, the big run. And you know, nowadays, it's really, really hard to, to, keep, to keep elite running backs to just no yards gained. If they're going to commit to the guy, if they're going to give him 25, they're going to give him 30 carries. I mean, they're going to chip away. They're, you know, but it's eliminating that explosive and keeping that average down as much as possible. And then you gotta, you got to do a great job of mixing in looks and mixing in you know, how they're attacking so that his reads are different, the old line's reads are different, and you got to try to stay ahead of the curve on that. All right, thank you all for being here.